you're in the custody of the state. The state is your parent. But bureaucracy can never love a child. Every child deserves a loving home. They just deserve that, period. And just letting them know that there are opportunities for them to have their voices heard. And what I found was that it was healing to engage in advocacy efforts. This is the Young People Lead Podcast. Let's activate our generation. Welcome to episode five of season one of the Young People Lead podcast series. In this episode, we are taking a deep dive into the child welfare system and looking at the ways that young people are engaging in changing the system. But first, let me tell you about the podcast series. This exciting new series is hosted by youth policy consultants from the American Youth Policy Forum, powered by Children's Defense Fund. This is the podcast that demonstrates that young people can and should lead by telling stories from the front lines of where youth are transforming policies for the better, as well as examining research on the policies that most affect us. This season, we're standing on policy. That's right. Season one is dedicated to standing on policy, activating our generation. Throughout this season, six of us youth policy consultants We'll take you, our listeners, on a journey to understand how young people are making a difference in the policies that affect them most. We will talk to experts, researchers, and youth leaders working on policies in education, the legal system, child welfare, and the workforce. If you are a young person looking to catalyze change, this podcast is for you. We also invite researchers and leaders in youth-focused organizations across the country to listen in because we are sure you're going to want to hear what our forthright guests and passionate young adult policy consultants have to say. Hi there, listeners. My name is Daphne Sanchez, and I'm your host for this episode of Standing on Policy on Child Welfare. I'm here with my co-host, Jordan Wilson. Hey, everybody. We're youth policy consultants with the American Youth Policy Forum, and we are excited to have this conversation with two amazing guests, Sixto Cancel and Idelia Robinson Confer. But before we introduce you to our guest, we want to tell you a little bit about ourselves. Jordan, so tell me, why are you interested in policy and child welfare? Yeah, Daphne, I'm really interested in learning a lot more about this topic because I actually work as a youth coach in a transitional housing dormitory for youth in Connecticut's foster care system right now. They're roughly between the ages of 18 and 21. And I'm really interested in connecting those dots to like what I'm seeing when I'm at work and like what our experts and our guests have to say today and like what the research tells us and just being able to tie that back for the young people that I'm working with every day. So I'm really excited. So Daphne, I know you have already hosted a podcast episode on this topic during last year's Credible Messenger podcast. I know you are really able to connect with your guests, connect with other young people. What makes you passionate about policy in the child welfare system? Being a young person with lived experience in the foster care system, honestly, it wasn't something that I was really passionate about at first um, until I was in it. There's something so important about your environment that I don't think many people understand. This time around, I'm really excited to learn more about the policy surrounding child welfare. What does that look like? This is really important to me and for those that are listening, because it shows that our voices do matter. Uh, Young people do matter. We do have a say in how these decisions affect us and those behind us and those younger than us. And also, I'm really excited to hear from another young person with lived experience, especially we do get to hear two different perspectives working on the same causes. So that's just going to be really exciting to to tune into. Yeah, I totally agree. Let's hear what our guests have to say. Should we get started? Yes, let's introduce you to our guests. We are so excited to speak to our first guest, youth advocate, Idelia Robinson Confer. Idelia is a dedicated advocate, speaker, and policy consultant. Idelia holds a bachelor's in psychology and a trauma-informed care certificate from California University of Pennsylvania. She is currently pursuing an NPA in policy research and analysis at the University of Pittsburgh. 
Thank you, Idalia, for joining me today. I'm so happy to have you here. I really relate to you and your experiences. So for our listeners, can you tell us about some of the experiences that you had in your life that spurred your passion for child welfare and what ignites your passion for this work as well? Yeah, absolutely. So my passion for advocating in the child welfare space really comes from my own personal experiences. I spent eight years navigating Pennsylvania's child welfare system, and it became clear to me that I wanted to become an advocate when I was transitioning out or also known as aging out of the child welfare system. When I was aging out, I faced a number of different challenges, including emotional dysregulation, struggle building and maintaining relationships. But I think the most significant one was really having a lack of agency and autonomy over my life. And what I found was that it was healing to engage in advocacy efforts. And the first advocacy effort I really leaned into was a youth action board in my state. It was a space where I found my voice. I was able to build some of those self-advocacy skills that I was lacking, a sense of control over my life. And I could really use my perspectives and experiences to create change. And through this healing, I think I also acknowledge that a lot of things that have happened in my life were not my fault, but it was my responsibility to really lean into that healing and to move forward. And I mention this because I think I've come to a realization that my story is rooted in generational trauma. I think it's where I realized that I am in a space where I can advocate for those who come after me in the system, but also recognizing that there's people who do not have the space, currently do not have the opportunity to voice um, and have a platform like we do here today. So I think there are so many untold stories, and I'm truly grateful just to be able to have an opportunity to be an advocate in this space. Well, you said a lot. Everything that you said just made so much sense. Um, and, and it's just totally relatable. I think that take everything else like background, ethnicity out of the way. Like it doesn't matter what you look like, where you came from. I mean, anybody's is susceptible to the system, right? Um, so that's 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 number one. That's super important. And two, that the opportunity was there. Um, it's so great to have a community to find a group of people that is willing to invest in you and invest in your vision and help support your your cause and your dreams. Like mm-hmm. you need a community to also help you develop those skills. And as you go, you develop more skills. I think that in this space, we're always learning every day. Um, you mentioned the lack of autonomy and freedom to be while being in the foster care system, and we were just kids but it wasn't necessarily like a comfortable, safe space for us to be our most authentic selves and explore ourselves, right? I know you shared with me previously, you know, not in the podcast, but you were in a group home. I was in a group home too. So I think that it also depends on where that group home environment looks like. You know, I couldn't say no to Bible study, you know, like there were days where I'm just like, okay, I want to go. And there were days I didn't, I didn't have a choice. I didn't have a say. With that being said, is there anything positive from being in a system, because we talk a lot about the negatives, but I'm really curious to hear from someone else with live experience to see if there was anything positive, even maybe just one thing that you've gained from that. Yeah, I think, as you just mentioned, we talk about the negatives a lot and what didn't work. Um, But I think it is really important to shed light on the positive experiences and what may have worked. There's three individuals that I'll mention that I think has really made a significant impact on my journey and where I am now. And that's first, I remember a specific caseworker It was an individual who took the time to identify like my unique needs, my goals, my aspirations, and really took the time to fully understand my unique situation. Um, So I want to mention that caseworker. I was also assigned a court-appointed special advocate when I first entered the child welfare system. And I think, you know, she was the person that was my biggest cheerleader, was there to celebrate my successes, help me navigate resources. We know the system is complex and it's hard to truly understand. So she was really my person to do that. And then also I had the opportunity to live with a kinship family who was connected to my biological family in my late teens. And I think going back to what you just said, it was the first time I was able to show up in a space and be my authentic self. So I really wanted to shed light on the individuals that the system has put in my life during that time. Yeah, absolutely. It's so important to shed light and acknowledge that throughout the darkness, throughout everything, the confusion and the unknown, that there were some adults there that did acknowledge you, did help you along the way, gave you the truth, right? Like, definitely there there were some trustworthy adults in my life as well that have shed some light and gave me truth and said, hey, like, this is how it's going to (laughs) be. You better get your act together, you know, or hey, like, let me help you out in, in this area. I had a caseworker who paid for my prom package 
I had that one case worker and I'll never forget, but she came through and she was like, uh, uh-uh, like, I'm not, I'm not going to let you like graduate and not have the experience that you deserve. So it's amazing. Um, and, and I so, think, yeah, something that you just mentioned is, and I think both of us have just, you know, um, highlighted it, but one person can really have a significant impact on your life. So I continue to talk about it in my advocacy spaces, but how can we really ensure youth and young adults have access to permanent connections to mentors and to those supportive adults to be able to make that transition into adulthood. Credible messengers, right? So we need to find individuals with um, live experience and expertise in those areas that are capable and willing to go ahead and be like, like an anchor to young people in those spaces. And just someone just so just trustworthy, right? Like, um, Mm -hmm. so, you know, with that being said, like, with the support that you did have with with the individuals that you did look up to that had your back, how would you say in your own words that you are working to change the system? Yeah, absolutely. So I think for me, I always ask myself, how can I invest the time and resources into, again, the young people who come after us um, within the system? So just to name like a few things that I'm involved in right now, I have become really, really involved in the youth homelessness system in Pennsylvania, um, acknowledging that when older youth in foster care do not receive the appropriate services, we know they have an increased risk of becoming homeless. As part of that, my Youth Action Board in Western Pennsylvania advocated for youth homelessness demonstration program funding. And we received $3.7 million to address youth homelessness, make it rare, brief, and non-recurring. These projects are still in the implementation process, but I think it's just an example of how powerful it is for young people to be part of those conversations, be part of the advocacy, to be part of the planning, and to be part of the development of these projects. So that's one thing. And then I'm currently a um, youth homelessness system improvement grant consultant, which is currently funds to do systems change work designed to reduce youth homelessness. So really assisting communities and making system improvements related to partnerships. So how can we cross collaborate with child welfare, um, healthcare, mental health services, education and employment, and then addition planning and data-based decision making with that. So that's this kind of the space I've really leaned into, um, acknowledging, like I said, that we know older youth need those appropriate resources when they are aging out of the child welfare system like absolutely you said a lot there but main thing is it's like you come out of the system we're just lost we're just like FAFSA how do we do that Mm -hmm. you know or like I drive a car you know how do I some of us are not even being provided those resources while we're in there you mentioned youth homelessness and I wonder from your experience and the things that you see over there, I'm just curious to know what does that look like in your area of expertise? Yeah, so we know that there are many different causes to youth becoming homeless, whether that's family conflict, whether that's not making a successful transition out of the child welfare system. We know that it looks differently too. So I work with a youth action board that's primarily rural, um, covers a rural region. And we know that that looks like not like what most people would think of youth homelessness more as couch surfing. So just acknowledging that it looks different. That's what I, that's what I thought too. Uh, Couch surfing, like living with like relatives momentarily. So thank you for sharing that. Um, So how have you been able to engage your peers, your community in the same causes that you advocate for? This is a great question. Um, And I think it's still ongoing work in some of my advocacy spaces. Um, But I think I'll just mentioning the Western PA um, Youth Action Board that I was um, referring to, something that we have been successful in is um, hosting trainings, listening sessions. So we hosted a few trainings to community members, to community organizations that are working with youth and young adults to really share what authentic youth engagement looks like, what does lived experience and how can um, you implement lived experience into their programming to improve policies, procedures, and programs. We've also had a training on like power sharing. How do we share power among adults and young people in the room? Another thing that we've done is listening sessions. So for those who are not familiar with listening sessions, it's really a platform to reduce those power dynamics to say like young people are going to be in control of the space. 
So we had opportunities to host a listening session where we voiced our concerns. We shared our experiences with some of these youth serving systems, um, shared our ideas, and it was all youth led. So those are two things that we found successful. But of course, we're still working really hard to partner with all these local organizations that I'm talking about to do resource sharing. We talk a lot about like we provide young people resources, but like how do we actually teach them how to navigate the resources? It's 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 very different to put a resource in front of someone versus actually walking step by step to ensure that they're they're getting the resource that you're providing them. But we know uh, cross systems collaboration and collaborating with different agencies is definitely something we're trying to improve in our region. I hope y'all take notes. I hope you guys are taking notes <laughs> because that's something that is needed, at least in my community here. That's so smart. Just having like agencies come to like these after school programs and just give talks and do workshops and educate and inform. Honestly, that is so smart. Um, that's something that I'm going to take note and bring up. And you also mentioned like showing the young people how to navigate the resources because hello, like finances, right? Like if you mm -hmm. were to say, hey, like if, if a young person comes out of the system, they have no credit and you tell them, oh, just open a bank account with like Chase okay but that doesn't help them walk them through it go to the bank show them how to open their own bank account let them know hey this is your card this is your spending limit you know like hold them accountable check in on them right like that type of support is just so needed so you made a valid point we also need to teach young people how to navigate these resources that reassurance is so important and checking in is so important for them yeah, absolutely. I think you brought up two other great points that I just like to build off of. So you mentioned financial literacy. What I've been hearing from all of my peers and the young people that I work with is that we need to do better with financial literacy. Um, and the other thing that came to my mind when you were talking about that is when you're speaking about credit is we know that young people who are trying to obtain housing, landlords want like rental history. They want credit, right? Um, they don't want to rent to certain individuals. So there's so many different hurdles. And that's what I'm saying with like resource sharing and building partnerships. How can we continue to do that to make sure that we're like working together as a community, as a region? So I just wanted to mention that as well. You hit it in the nail. The The key was, you know, the landlords not renting to certain like folks thinking about like the LGBTQ community, right? Like, mm -hmm. especially if they just came out of the system. So with that being said, um, tell us a bit about the policy recommendations that you have made and advocated for and where have you found difficulty in those? Yeah, so this past summer, I had the opportunity to serve as a congressional intern in the Senate, and uh, I also served as a foster youth intern for the Congressional Coalition on Adoption Institute, and I presented a policy recommendation that had like three sections, which is first, um, what I mentioned a lot of times today, which is how do we continue to implement youth engagement and decision making? How do we create meaningful opportunities for youth with lived experience to advise federal agencies in their policy development? And the second part is that is how do we continue to provide guidance to states to ensure that child welfare agencies are engaging young people in decision making regarding their future, allowing them to pick their chosen path? And then the last section of that is to increase support of adults, permanent connections for older youth in the child welfare system. I think these three components are super, super important. I do not believe that any young person should leave foster care with less support of adults than when they entered. And I believe that by developing permanent relationships and amplifying the young people's voice, we can continue to give them the guidance, resources, and opportunities they need to make that transition into adulthood. So those were some of my policy recommendations. And where have I found difficulty? I think we can all agree that policy is complex. Um, it takes a lot of time to see change. Resource allocation, we know that securing resources can be challenging in the environment of competing priorities. And then the last thing I'll mention here is systems change work is hard. And I think implementing youth voices and making them, you know, part of those decision making processes is, is something new. We live in a culture where adults believe they know what's best for young people. And that's kind of how the system is created. So how do we continue to have conversations acknowledging that youth and young people are developmentally at a place where they should be part of decisions that are impacting their life? And the last difficulty I'll mention is we have an overburdened child welfare system. And I'm sure everyone listening today and everyone on can agree to that. We have case managers not receiving the appropriate pay. We have high caseloads. We have secondary trauma happening, and we need to continue to invest in the well-being of the individuals working on the ground level. So those are all the difficulties. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. What have been your wins through 
your policy recommendations? I think for me, I celebrate the small wins, right? So increased awareness to have the opportunity to to share my story, to talk about the importance of youth voice in the child welfare system and how being able to find my voice through advocacy has truly impacted me both personally and professionally is a win to me. So, so of course, you know, we do understand how hard this work is, especially to get things passed, right? And policy, because it's complex, like you mentioned. And this is an uphill battle. And a lot of people check out daily, right? I'm sure you've had your moments. What keeps you motivated or inspired to keep doing this work? And then what advice do you have for other young people that want to develop for change in the child welfare system? So I think what keeps me motivated is what I mentioned earlier, is that I had incredible individuals who really invested their time in me because of their support. Um, I am where I am. I can make a difference in the lives of individuals, just like my mentors and those, those adults did for me. The other thing I think that keeps me motivated is leaning on those around me. Uh, this work is not easy. So to take time to um, really lean into my support system, to take time to practice self-care. And self-care for me looks like spin classes, therapy, sometimes just doing absolutely nothing. So that is what motivates me and keeps me inspired. And then what advice I have for young people who want to advocate for change, I think emphasizing that advocacy is challenging, especially when it's close to your own experiences. So again, how do you practice self-care, lean on those around you? Um, Change takes time, so celebrate the small wins. And then I think the last thing and the most important thing that I'd like to say to future young advocates is the importance of owning your own narrative and taking control of your own story. You know, when you're in these spaces and you're sharing your experiences, make sure it's in a supportive environment and where people are valuing your perspective. I just think it's so important to be cautious in settings and be selective with who you choose to share things and what you choose to share. And remember that your unique experiences are something others should feel fortunate to learn about. So I think that's so important for future young advocates. Yes. Thank (laughs) you so much, Idalia. That was amazing. You said it best. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for sharing this information with us. Young person to young person. This is a young person to young person conversation. And I don't have these conversations every day. So this was great. Thank you so much, Daphne. This has been amazing. It's always a pleasure to collaborate and work together in these spaces. Wow, Jordan, that was amazing. I had a great conversation with Idalia. Here are my few takeaways. I think what I found was really interesting was how she mentioned that, you know, a lot of young people are in these communities and they're giving all these resources and they're not taught how to navigate them. Like, for example, there are young people that age out of the system and they're not taught how to do their FAFSA or how to do their taxes or how to fill out their W-4 form, like when they're going to start a job, like, you know, they they age out at 21 or whatever the age and they're, they're kind of pretty much expected to be being a responsible adult but there's just so many other things that come into play yeah I thought she said some really powerful things and you know I'm really excited to hear what Sixto has to say because I know Sixto we actually both grew up together in the city of Bridgeport Connecticut shout out to Bridgeport and I'm just really excited to hear about all of the work that he's been doing I'm super proud you know I see him having dinners with Vice President Harris and he's in DC all the time and so I'm just really excited to hear what he has to say what he's done And, you know, he's definitely, you know, showing out for Bridgeport. So I'm super excited about that. All right. So, yes, let me introduce you listeners to Sixto. All right. So Sixto Cancel is the founder and CEO of Think of Us. Think of Us is a research and design lab driving systematic change in child welfare. Through focused projects and sweeping initiatives, T-O-U, which is Think of Us, drives structural changes in child welfare policy and practice. Sixto was named as Forbes Top 30, Under 30, Social Entrepreneurs, and is on the 2021 Forbes Under 30 Listerboard. Woo! Ah! Okay, and honestly, he has so many other accolades that we don't have time to cover them all here. But please check the show notes to learn more about him. Welcome, Sixto. We are so excited to have you join us. Sixto, so you have a very powerful story. And as a youth advocate, I really identify with what you're doing. Can you tell us about how you came to your role in advocacy and who was your support system? 
I had a journey that was very different than other foster youth because most foster youth come into the system and then about half of them go home within the year. But that wasn't my story. I entered foster care as an 11 month baby. Then I was adopted at the age of nine. It was a very racist and abusive adoption. And so I found myself, you know, couch surfing by 13. And when I was finally 15, that was the moment where I realized I really need to like find my voice and speak up for myself. And I ended up having to put a recorder on my chest to just get the evidence of what was going on. And then I was able to come back into the system at 16. But in the beginning, I feel like the journey started with the anger of the injustice that occurred when I couldn't get back in because no one believed me. It was actually the feeling of, this is so messed up. I cannot believe you did this. I had enough emotional intelligence to say, like, there are bad people in the world. And that's who ended up adopting me. So I wasn't really blaming the system for the bad adoption because she was a very a person who was just able to deceive a lot of people. But it impacted me deeply that when I finally found my voice to advocate for myself, that the system kept opening investigations, closing investigations. And I really didn't get to people believe in me until I really had um, the evidence for people to believe me. I just want to say that's crazy. You know, we believe kids until we don't, mm. right? We we believe kids until we don't. And then we're asking from them, okay, well, where's the evidence? You know, they're very quick to believe when we say that we've been harmed. But now when it's time for us to take a stand for ourselves and participate in speaking our truth, we're asked for more through your experiences and your journey. You ended up making think of us. Can you tell us a little bit more about what Think of Us is, share with people what your mission is and how it incorporates the voice of young people? I think of us, we're a nonprofit. And what we're focused on is how do we help the system transform? Um, and the way we're thinking about that is how do we actually accelerate the things that are being designed in the system by centering lived experience? And so that means directly hearing from people who are impacted and when we get that understanding, we need to understand what well, all the people around the person that they're serving. So what do the fiscal folks who have to approve reimbursements think? What does the program person who designs programs think? What does that frontline person who works with that young person or that birth parent, what do they think? And from there, what we're able to do is truly understand what is the potential solution. So our organization is looking at how do we not reform a system? How do we not just improve a system? But how does the system have a new way of operating? A system may place a child in a, in a family member's home as their first placement, right? And helping a system think through that. It may be that we do research, right? Because we have a couple of different departments. We have a research department. We have a design and implementing um, department, a tech department. And then we have like our policy department and in there there's community building. And so we have all these different teams that think of us that are working towards a larger story arc. It's a community. That's how what I heard. It's like it's it's a community working together for the same goal and mission. Thank you for sharing that. That was really powerful for me. Do you have any perhaps any particular research that you'd like to uplift in our podcast today or anything that you may have? read upon or discuss that you'd like to share like the yes. away from like home study yes so um on our website think of us.org uh, when stuff hits the fan think of us so that you can remember that so think of us.org under the use cases we have a couple research profiles so we've done research called aged out from the perspective of young people aging out what's missing right um, what are the supports that I needed? And in particular, we wanted to know in that study, do you have supportive adults or not? Because so many people who we worked with in the system said, well, foster youth don't have supportive adults. But when we dug in and we researched and we talked to 200 young people um, over five different jurisdictions, the truth was is that young people do have adults in their life. The question is, has the system actually enabled those relationships to thrive or not? So the adults that are in your life may teach you things, you know, like interviewing for a job, like looking at your resume. But, you know, we've relied on programs and we need to still have that. Um, but we've relied on programs to overprogram things that we should be getting from parents and mentors. And programs have an opportunity to be able to engage those 
adults who are in our lives um, to say, hey, how might we, you know, all together work on that interviewing practice? How might we all together think about how to, you know, drive a car and learn how to how, how to do that? Um, so there's that study. And then our away from home study was really created because there were all of these voices that were in the field talking about, is a group homes a good thing? Is it a bad thing? And there were studies, but the interesting part was that no one had asked people with lived experience. And so we were missing from the conversation. And so we decided that we would go in and we would interview young people and that then we would write a report about that. And that report was published and it has informed 22 states and six jurisdictions, some states and counties around um, the experiences in group homes. Three have started to work towards getting unnecessary placement to zero. And then three have decided to do additional research that influenced their strategy, their initiatives. You you also mentioned about you, you have a department of policy and um, I'm familiar with some of the policy recommendations. So for instance, asking young people who would they like to live with kinship care. Can you tell us more about what it means to value centering youth voices in this work? Proximity is the ability to be close and have a deep nuanced understanding of anything, like whether it be a problem, whether it be a solution. So proximity is that action of being close. When it comes down to people who are growing up in the foster care system, what you have is a very complicated um, situation because you're in the custody of the state. The state is your parent, but bureaucracy can never love a child. And so if bureaucracy cannot love you and love is the main ingredient of a healthy development, then how is it that we are supposed to develop? And so what I see is a system that is rooted in people who are successful in spite of a condition that is meant to break you. When you don't know where you're going to sleep the next day, when you're put in a group home because you didn't fit in or you quote, quote, acted up too much, when you've experienced severe abuse that you don't even get to heal from that abuse or that neglect or whatever the situation may be, your parents might have unfortunately died, right? All these reasons why you're put in the system If you are coming into the system, there is trauma that you've experienced that you don't have the opportunity to heal from that because you're going through a toxic stress situation. Am I going to be able to stay in this home? Will I be kicked out tomorrow? Do I have to make new friends at a new school system? And all of these things have a tie back to policy. The way that we center lived experience in policy is to listen to the actual human experience, to gather data from the actual human experience, People don't intentionally want to make bad policy. People find it sometimes a little hard to listen. And so how do we actually create the conditions in which we can deliver thousands of people's stories and what their collective experiences of those thousands of people and say, here's what the clear evidence of need is. And now your policy has been affecting people this way. How about we work on changing that? And what does it look like to co-design some of those improvements? Right, because at the end of the day, we're human beings. We're not a case file. If you take me away from my family to put me in a new family, the expectation for me as a child is to enter into a loving family as well. Meanwhile, like you mentioned, we're over here trying to heal from the trauma that we just endured. That's really important. That's what really came up for me. So thank you for sharing that, Sixto. Besides think of us, right? Besides think of us. Where are the young people who are engaged in changing policies in the child welfare system? Where do you see young people making a difference? One of the things that I've just come to realize is that young people are just not playing about social issues anymore. And that I believe that folks are engaged in such a way that it is engagement across the spectrum. And so I think back to the beginning of the Biden-Harris administration and, um, you know, and it's still going on today, but every single week there is a weekly call where young advocates who are working on gun violence, who are working on environmental issues, housing, homelessness, foster care, I mean, you name it, they come together whether they believe in the position that the White House is taking or they don't to share the progress that young people are making on those particular topics. I think that the most interesting thing here is to understand what are all the tools and levers, because not every group of young people have that, and not enough young people know this. And so for me, when I see folks organizing, I'm like so proud of the people like 
there is an opportunity to use so many levers when it comes down to making our government better. And yet, I think that that information is available to the exclusive few. And it takes a lot of experience of doing work and projects on the ground. And I wonder to what extent that we could actually be fostering that type of knowledge for people to be able to have. Yeah, because who's teaching us how to navigate through these resources? And why are these resources so exclusive? Well, first off, what what is this call that young people are on that I'm missing? <laughs> um, it's a White House call with the Office of Public Engagement. Uh, where certain youth leaders have come and they get to engage on very important topics. Okay, so I'm going to, we're going to get, I'm going to get that information because I'd like to be part of that conversation. But just to now, just going back to what you mentioned previously, it's like some of the information is being guarded from us, from young folks. We're not being really taught how to find credible information. I just want to say that I agree with your, with your point that you're making. Mind you, six. So you know, I do not have these conversations every day. So I really, mm-hmm. yeah, I really am enjoying this. <laughs> you know, when I think about where we're at in the movement of child welfare, I'm extremely excited. And the reason I'm excited is because the mandate for child welfare for so long has been one where you are expected to execute an investigation when you receive a child abuse report or neglect, and then you're screening children in or out of foster care. And in some cases, you have the opportunity to get referred to a service. But where we're at today is that there's two new departments that are being created. And I'm using departments as a way to simply understand um, what's happening in child welfare. If you can finance programs at the state level that are going to give people access to on-the-ground support around substance abuse, mental health, and parenting classes, and then let's keep that family together by putting them through that program. You know, Obama's administration said, we have to have normalized experiences for children when they're in the system. They should be able to sleep at a friend's house. They should be able to participate in after school activities. They should be able to do these things. And so as a result, you know, the law changed and now um, you're able to actually, you're able to have foster parents have more flexibility to say, yes, you can go spend the night there. And then during this administration, another department, another cultural shift is occurring where we actually have people saying we should place young people with their extended family members. And so this aha moment that doesn't feel so aha was just like an epiphany that people had. But there was regulation that was just passed where um, states can now match their money to be able to pay for extended family members who go through a kin specific process of getting licensed and having that child placed with them. The White House estimates that this is going to unlock about $3 billion over the next 10 years. And so what we're living in the middle of is a revolution. We used to just be a foster care department. Now there is a prevention department and a kinship care department. Wow. Like you said, I'm very excited for the future. That's really amazing. I think that my inner child feels very seen right now. (laughs) Because, Mm. because, because like every child deserves a loving home. They just deserve that, period. With Think of Us and perhaps in your own personal life, what impacts do you hope to have over the next 10 years of your journey? Where do you see yourself and where do you see Think of Us? Yeah, you know, I... I'm so honored and so blessed that I get to use this vessel. I think of us to have so much opportunity to have an impact, right? I have a team of almost 50 people. I have people who conduct research. I have people who engage people with lived experience in the community. I have people who know how to design programs. I have people who know how to build technology softwares and people on policy and practice, right? So when I think about what the opportunity is, It's not just about me. It's about what this collective network of people who work in this organization can do. And my hope is that what we're able to do is push the system to have a new normal. And that new normal is a value that is rooted in keeping families together when it's appropriate, when it's safe, when it's possible, um, because you either prevented that family from coming in or... You actually turned around and said, you know what, let me, this child has to be placed in foster care. Sometimes that is a fact. Sometimes you have to do that. There's been severe sexual abuse, severe physical abuse. These are people's real stories. And 
staying at home is not an option sometimes, but an extended family member could be an option. It could be an option to have someone that you've known all your life, that you've grown up with, whether that be someone in the church or your dance teacher that you've known. The ability to actually say, you know what, the system is going to prioritize you living with them. I know it's a complicated six-month process for them to get licensed, but actually, let's not do that. Let's go ahead and figure out how we take care of the licensing in the long run. But in this very moment, what is the kin-specific process that you can go to to make sure that you're in a safe placement with someone that you're choosing, but that is not preventing you from being able to be connected? This is amazing. Your vision is amazing. Um, Thank you. I'm looking forward to being in that vision too. I share the same vision yes. as you, you know, and um, I'm really excited for the future. I'm really excited to continue to work on building a better future and leaving this world better than when we came in. Um, I so appreciate y'all. I want to thank everyone, you know, for this opportunity to talk and um, I can't wait to hear it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Six Song. You're brilliant. You're a brilliant person. Oh, thank you. <laughs> brilliant. Thank you. Wow. Um, I honestly have no words. That was such a great conversation, Daphne. Um, even though I already know Sixo, so it was it was great to hear from him. I learned a lot from him and Idelia. As I mentioned earlier, you know, I'm really excited to bring back the key takeaways from this conversation to the work that I do every day and just letting them know that there are opportunities for them to have their voices heard. And I'm just really excited for our listeners to hear this episode. Daphne, you know, what are your takeaways? What are you hoping our listeners leave learning today? how to take action really i think that everybody knows that child welfare it is a sensitive topic it's not a secret right like but how can more people get involved how can we continue to have these conversations right you can you know be a, a credible messenger right to that young person you can help them find the necessary resources right as we mentioned you can help get involved and listen to to the to, to our podcast to Sixto to Idalia you can keep in touch with us right how to also remember that at the end of the day kids are human beings and they should be treated as such the power that we give is to the young person it's up to them to know what's best for them as well we can't make all the decisions for them too because at the end of the day we're taking that right away from them so at the end of the day is that truly welfare for those who have been through this system itself, you're not alone. So first and foremost, for those who have aged out or are in the system or know someone, like you're not alone. We're in this together, right? We're here to support each other, uplift each other. This is a reminder that your voice does matter and we're here to listen. And there are people that are willing to listen to you. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this episode of Standing on Policy, Acting in My Generation, the first season in the Young People Lead podcast led by youth policy consultants from the American Youth Policy Forum, powered by Children's Defend Fund. This is the podcast that demonstrates that young people can and should lead by telling stories from the front lines of youth changing policy, as well as examining the research on policies that most affect us. This podcast is funded by the American Youth Policy Forum, powered by Children's Defense Fund, in collaboration with the American Institute for Research. Season one of Young People Lead, Standing on Policy, Activating Our Generation, is hosted and directed by a group of youth policy consultants from AYPF, the American Youth Policy Forum, including Trail Williams, Kyla Woods, Tyra Beeman, Jordan Wilson, Cody Moon and me, Daphne Sanchez. This episode was directed and hosted by me, Daphne Sanchez. We believe that young people can lead in the legal system, foster care, education, and workforce to ensure policies that encourage our success. This show is produced, edited, and mixed by Sarah Daggett of Daggett Consulting, LLC. Thanks for listening. Next episode is the last episode. Tune in to hear me, all six youth policy consultants, and Dr. LaShonda Kilgore. Make sure you tune in. Can't wait for you guys to hear it.